Finally, with this uh, section on ad adsorption, and last time when we did it, we, we just looked at a few of the adsorbent types available to us, and we, we spoke a bit about activated alumina, this is the first one. We discussed activated carbon X, this is coming from natural sources generally, uh, where they would take these coconut shells, for example, is one of the most common forms of activated carbon. And those are then, uh, they're heated up, and almost partially oxidized and set, set, and that's the activation step. Then the other one that's most interesting, and the reason why adsorption really kicks off, is the use of zeolites, which are, are crystal lattices with very specific shapes. Those formulas shown over there are just a few of, of the zeolites that can be manufactured. As, as noted down here, I've added to the slide that there's about 40 naturally occurring zeolites which is what I guess sparked the interest in them and uh, made them show that they're useful. But then subsequently, well, there's over 150 of them have been created with various combinations of ions over here in the first, as the first element, and then the ratio of those with the aluminum oxide and silicon oxide uh, is different. And depending on those ratios that you pick, you can create a very different kind of zeolite with a specific opening. So there's two openings that are of interest. One is this mid, the larger opening here the, called the alpha cage. Um, so it's symmetric on all eight, all, all sides, of, sorry, all six sides of that. And then the beta cage, these filament points, uh, they're also an open structure. They don't appear so from the figure, but they also have some form of opening in them, but much, much smaller. So these, these units then have a moderate surface area per gram, 650 will show us is, is about an average uh, surface area per gram of zeolite. But the main, the main item of interest on these is that specific pore opening. So then um, we've got to, so for certain angstrom sizes, we can pick, pick a zeolite from a table, and there are tables and tables and tables of them published uh, based on their specific sizes and their applications for them. So, so in the first row there, for example, the small pore openings, that's incredibly tiny pore opening compared to all the um, naturally occurring uh, and, and manufactured adsorbents. So three actually is a very, very small pore opening, uh, will adsorb water and small molecule of ammonia. And it's also then used to dehydrate or dry with unsaturated hydrocarbons. The four angstrom adsorbents, slightly larger molecules would go into those then, and uh, they can dehydrate saturated hydrocarbons. Then larger and larger zeolites then start to do interesting things such as uh, separating paraffins from isoparaffins and isomers from each other. So they're very, very good for isomer separation and, and, and gas separation in general. The market sizes, yeah, unfortunately these numbers are pretty out of date for various adsorbents. Um, but I would expect this ratio to just maintain between them, between them, between them, and just get larger over time. But the interesting one is activated carbon, by far the, the dominant adsorbent, and the, the major use of it is for water treatment. Uh, so, municipal water treatment, for example, is, is, is a major source of activated carbon use. Um, it's also exactly what's inside those water filters that you would use at home. So one way that we look at, at these adsorbents to characterize them is by their pore diameters. We spoke about that in the last class. That's the key characterizing parameter. Now we can go determine what those pore, pores are, um, not necessarily with microscopy, we could always confirm that, but uh, there's a method called helium and, and mercury porosimetry. Uh, that there's a bit of detail there in that reference if you're interested to read, to read up the, the laboratory procedure for it. But essentially we, uh, we can calculate a graph that looks like this, that shows the spread of pore diameters. We, we clearly don't expect a sample of material to have the identical pore, pore diameter, for an, especially for naturally occurring uh, adsorbents or adsorbents that are derived from natural materials. The only one that's, that is uh, very specific is zeolites. So here, zeolites are always numbered like 5a, 2x, this surface so numbering. So this particular zeolite um, has no distribution in the pore diameter. It's very much 
exact because of the crystal lattice structure. But all the others, there will be a range of diameters for them. Okay, so an MSC is molecular sieve carbon. So this is an activated carbon that's been created in a very specific way uh, so that it's competitive with zeolite. So it's called molecular sieve carbon because I mean, the alternative name for zeolites are molecular seeds. So MSC, molecular sieve carbon, is a competitive adsorbent um, derived from actuated carbon, but just manufactured in a specific way so that it has very small pore diameters. So typically, as I said, uh, we won't see pore diameters much, much smaller than three angstroms. That's about the lowest level that we, we would go to. Bearing in mind also that a hydrogen atom is one angstrom, so it doesn't really make sense to try and push for anything uh, smaller than that. Okay, then um, just a few examples of where this is used before we get into some of the details. Uh, two, two definitions up here in the slide as well. Uh, one is purification. So that's a conceptually purification is considered the adsorption where you're dealing with minor impurities, so 10% or so of lead or less of adsorbate that you're interested in recovering, we would call that purification. And with bulk separation, we refer to that as when it's roughly equal, equal mixtures. So if we're purifying substances, uh, one, one common one is to remove uh, water vapor. That's one of, by far one of the major uses of adsorbents is to to desiccate materials or to remove water vapor. Um, there's a few other examples up there, but the other interesting one is to remove carbon dioxide from natural gas. So I've asked there, what are some alternatives that you're aware of for removing carbon dioxide? Which ones have we heard before? Membranes? Other technologies? Carbon capture and sequestration is an upcoming topic that's important to uh, chemical engineers. So you'll see this over and over. Any other ways of removing CO2? There's adsorption as well of CO2 in, in organic uh, liquids. So monoethanolamine, for example, CO2 would be ad adsorbed in the <coughs> into those membranes is now probably one of the most um, all, all newer systems generally investigating CO2 tend to be using membranes to separate out carbon dioxide. But here is an example of, uh, so, so adsorbents would be an alternative method of doing that as well. Um, if we're looking at air separation, we've obviously got cryogenic distillation to separate oxygen from nitrogen, but also we will often find on, on certain zeolites that nitrogen will bond more strongly than oxygen will. So it is one way to separate separate those two from each other. Water from ethanol, so we've got, uh, the problem over there is we run into um, heavy energy costs for distillation. Uh, we could also then consider adsorbents as an alternative. Now these are all gas, gas-based um, Separations, but adsorbents are equally well used when we've got a liquid system. So here, one of the most common uses, and this is where it, it really picked up with, was removing toxic compounds from water before being discharged to the municipal streets. So in the 70s, especially in the United States and in Canada, there was a big push by the, the equivalent of the EPA. The government agencies would, previously companies would just put formaldehyde and formula down into river systems like thousands of pounds per day of this material. Now that's, that's not allowed. And, and one of the major uses for adsorbents was, and still is, to purify those waste streams prior to discharge to get the concentrations down to incredibly low levels. Uh, so so those, are, those are common liquid-liquid separations. Isomers, um, another one. So here, there's two isomers of cresol now. I'm not sure why people want this substance because this is the substance that's in human sweat and pig odor. But <laughs> I guess there's a need to separate these two isomers from each other. But we can clearly see here from this diagram um, that the geometric shape of them is, is quite different. And so a zeolite there would be incredibly effective. One, one of them would enter the zeolite quite effectively, the others would not. 
So those are the, why they are called molecular seeds, because at the molecular level they're seeding out based on the size. The other one that I have, fructose and dextrose is a, is a common one. And then the last one I want to just quickly touch on is gold and cyanide solutions. Uh, this was an interesting one. I'm familiar with this one growing up in South Africa and my, my uh, having access to gold mines and working on gold mines in several co-op terms. But this one always fascinates me. This one combines a lot of interesting separations and chemistry in, in, in this example. So let's take a look at what happens here. Uh, if we have crushed rock, we have gold in the order of a few grams per ton, three or four grams per ton of rock. So imagine a whole ton of that, you only have three or four grams of gold. Now that gold is, um, if we had to draw it, which it's not, so if we had to take a particle of sand, and that's in the order of two to three microns, we'll have a little piece of gold over there, perhaps. So just a small little few atoms of gold. We put that crushed rock into cyanide solution, and that gold that's exposed out here, that's why we want to crush these sand really small so we expose as much gold as possible. That gold that's exposed will uh, use that and dissolve it in sodium cyanide, or potassium cyanide, or calcium cyanide, <coughs> And this is a redox reaction, um, and will form the sodium and the orocyanide compound. So AuCN2, that's my orocyanide complex, that's now in solution. So I'll take that gold and essentially leach it off the, the particle. So that's a separation step, leaching. We don't cover it in this course, but leaching is, is a separation step. So I'm separating my gold from my mineral base that it sits on and I'm taking it into aqueous form, sodium cyanide, so that's a solution. Now, I want to recover that gold that's in liquid form. Well, one thing that's interesting that, that's been done since about the 60s is to take this mixture of sand and gold and cyanide and throw in activated carbon. What will happen then is that this orocyanide complex will adsorb onto the activated carbon. So you're removing the sodium cyanide, uh, sorry, the orocyanide complex out of, out of solution into the activated carbon. And what's interesting is that you drive that equation forward even more because I'm removing this out of solution. So I'm encouraging the reaction to go forward in the direction that I want it to go into even further still. So it drives that equilibrium in a desirable direction and separates the orocyanide complex onto, onto the activated carbon. You can end up with about eight kilograms of gold loaded onto a ton of carbon. So you've, you've gone from about eight grams per ton of gold in sand to about eight <coughs> kilograms of gold per ton of activated carbon that you've loaded up. But now you've got this mixture of sand and sodium cyanide and sodium hydroxide, pretty nasty chemicals, and activated carbon. What we do now is we then filter that so my sand is crushed down to 2 to 5 microns in, in size, but my activated carbon particles are in the order of millimeters. So very easy to then use screens that we learned about earlier. So I, I, I use a screen to separate that activated carbon from the slurry, from the sand. Now I've got my activated carbon loaded with gold. I can go desorb that off by uh, contacting it with, with pure cyanide solution and in caustic environment. We'll then just leach the gold cyanide complex off, and then I can precipitate it out with zinc. What that does is now I've got the clean carbon, I've regenerated my activated carbon, I can recycle that back up, and then I've got my gold out, and I can purify that with metallurgical refining steps. So essentially what happens is that they do the, this in, in large, almost batch type reactors, but with counter current flows with this. So counter current instead of it's used, essentially it's just a large reactor with activated carbon and sand. So a number of interesting separation steps happening here and a, and a reaction step at the same time. Okay, so adsorption then, uh, it, it's competitive with other separations we've learned about, distillation, membranes, and adsorption, liquid-liquid extraction. But we would strongly consider it in these cases listed over here, for example, with 
my relative volatility between two components is low, I can consider adsorption. We also considered uh, liquid-liquid extraction as the case. So early on, uh, we said, why would we use liquid-liquid extraction over distillation? Well, when the relative volatility is low, that would be desirable. But adsorption is just as um, effective. If I would have to use large uh, amounts of energy due to high reflux ratios in the distillation or the success of temperatures from distillation um, would, would be required um, otherwise or a high pressure drop due to a membrane might have been required. So all these heavy sources of energy might prohibit me and so I would consider adsorption as an alternative. Uh, and there's a few others. If the membrane area that it would require would be too large or if I really need a high selectivity and I'm not getting that from distillation, I would then consider adsorption. The reason why adsorption can provide me high selectivity is we saw that if, with those molecular sieves, they have an incredibly high selectivity because of the very specific pore opening. That very specific pore size allows a certain size molecule to enter and so it's got incredibly high selectivity towards molecular size. Um, but there are a few disadvantages is that we're only using the surface of that adsorbent, so there's a lot of it that's not really effectively being used. We have to regenerate it afterwards or throw it out. So that mass separating agent is going to cost us some form of, of, of money. Um, we'll see, we'll, we'll try to regenerate it if possible by reversing the reaction. So when ad, adsorption occurring, it's reversible. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then also that adsorbent, if we, if we manipulate it and handle it, we're going to break it down over time. Um, so we'll, we'll see, as you saw there in the mining industry, we'll, we'll put the adsorbent activated carbon inside a reactor with a high shearing impeller. So they can handle uh, that stress. We can pump adsorbents around. We can put it through a centrifugal pump with no problem. It will still maintain the solute that is loaded onto it. We can put it through a filtration step. We can put it through cyclones. Uh, so if you want to separate your adsorbent from, from the feed stream, uh, we, can, we can do that as well. So we, we can really put it through a lot of mechanical stress, but it will break it down eventually. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, don't worry about all the, the words and stuff in there. It's really, um, it's excessive, but the main point here is that to illustrate a few new terms that we need to, to understand, and also to illustrate how large the surface area is of these adsorbents. So here's an example from Perry's. If you uh, take a, a porous material, its bulk density is in the order of 500 kilograms per meter cube. So that's referring to the activated carbon or the silica uh, or the alumina. That, that adsorbent has a, a moderate density. There's two definitions here that we need to be aware of. Interparticle void fraction. So that's the void fraction between particles. We're familiar with that. Um, in the packet bed reactor, that's the spacing or open space fraction between the particles. But there's also the intraparticle porosity or intraparticle voidage. That's the spacing within the particle itself. These adsorbents, as we saw but, uh, in the last class, are pretty open and porous themselves. So about what we're essentially saying is that half the volume of the adsorbent is, is open space. So a very high degree of porosity. And if we, it's safe to assume, in this case, that two-thirds of those open spaces are due to cylindrical pores with a, an approximate diameter of 14 angstroms, so 1.4 nanometers. If you go through those and use those numbers, and I'll leave, leave that for you to do on your own, uh, you can calculate the surface area of that adsorbent. There's enough information there to compute the surface area of that adsorbent using the formula for a cylinder and, and the area for it, you can calculate that, that one gram of the adsorbent would occupy two centimeters cubed. That's easy, we've got the density over there. So one gram of material, very small amount, two centimeters cubed. And then you can go ahead and calculate the surface area as uh, 1,150 meters squared per gram. So if you compare that to the, the stadium, like the university stadium here, depending on how you measure the stadium, you can get numbers that range between 5 to 8,000 meters squared. So that gives you an idea of the tremendous surface area provided by one gram of this material. 
And then you can also go ahead and calculate. We don't, I, as I said, I'll leave this up to you to try on your own. You can go see which percentage of that adsorbent is occupied by the, by the adsorbate. OK, so now let's take a look a bit at the mechanism of adsorption. Adsorption releases heat. So when material is adsorbed, so we've got, say, a water molecule being adsorbed onto activated carbon, which is what you get on uh, those little sachets that you would get in your electronics boxes, or any time, every time we have adsorption. This is without fail. There's no exception to this. It releases heat. Why would it do that? Any thoughts on, on why adsorption might release heat? Track. So Sam is saying we're stabilizing the particles. We're taking it out of the vapor stream or out of the fluid stream and adsorbing it onto the surface. What, what is that doing to the overall entropy of the system if we're looking from a thermodynamic point? Decreasing entropy, absolutely. So the moment we decrease entropy, uh, we can go take a look then at, um, you know, apply it to the Gibbs law. So entropy is decreasing, we're stabilizing the material, we're essentially reducing degrees of freedom in the fluid. And so if we start from our thermodynamic law over there that the Gibbs free energy, which we know must be negative for anything useful to happen, uh, we've got the heat released and then the temperature times the change in entropy. If we rearrange that for delta H, if delta G is negative in order for useful stuff to happen, and delta S has been reduced as well, overall delta H is negative. So we will always release heat to create for adsorption when adsorption takes place. The converse of that is if we add heat to a system that already has adsorption taking place, we can reverse it. Or, in other words, in order to reverse adsorbed material, we have to supply heat, supply energy to it, to get that entropy to go back up again. So, we will always release some form of heat when adsorption takes place, and there's two major types of adsorption that are considered based on the, this relative amount of heat release, <coughs> Why is, uh, and, and also the mechanism that take it. So physical adsorption um, releases small amounts of heat in the order of 30 to 60 kilojoules per mole, and that, the reason why this physical adsorption takes place is due to the van der Waals attractions between the adsorbate and the adsorbent. So van der Waals attractions are related to the dipole moments that are set up on the molecules. So a molecule like HCl will have a negative and a positive dipole. The adsorbent itself will have, uh, will have an overall charge. So within the interior of the adsorbent, those charges cancel out, but the surface of the adsorbent is going to be incredibly charged, either positive or negative. Okay, so the interior, those charges would ordinarily cancel out, but because these uh, adsorbents have such a high surface area, the overall surface of the adsorbent has some form of net charge, which then interacts with the molecules that we're going to adsorb onto it. When those come, come, to, come together and they adsorb, that adsorption step is for all intents and purposes instantaneous, there's no reaction rate, adsorption is, it just happens right away, there will be a certain amount of heat released. And then we can, re we can reverse that by supplying heat to the system, we can undo that adsorption. Chem adsorption or chemical adsorption is, have you guys, uh, when you did reactor design, do catalysis? Do you study catalysts in reactor design? In no, a little bit. Um, chem absorption comes from, uh, is, is the primary way that catalysts work. Uh, there's a chemical bond that's actually formed between the molecules and the adsorbent, and they will, in many cases, be an exchange of atoms there, or in other words, a chemical reaction taking place, leading to different reaction products. And those heats then of adsorption are in the order of 
speeds of reaction that you see from standard reaction systems. So 100 kilojoules per mole is a, non, is a standard number or order of magnitude number you'd see in normal chemical reactions. So very high amounts of heat release, but there's actually a chemical reaction taking place here as that adsorbent binds to the surface. And obviously it would require more energy to reverse that step. Um, so this is the mechanism by which catalysis takes place, is chemisorption. Um, these, these adsorbents will bind onto the surface of the adsorbent and react with other products in the fluid, or react with the adsorbent itself. Um, so we're not going to study this area. This is, this is very much the area of reactor design or advanced reactor design. Um, it's also the mechanism by which corrosion occurs. So we, we're not looking into that, but it is also a form of adsorption. We're going to consider the more moderate um, adsorption, physioadsorption, where that's easily reversible and there's no reaction taking place in the surface. Okay, and then the general thinking about this, and it's not, it's just a theory, um, but it's a way of thinking about it, is that the adsorbate will come into contact with the adsorbent and a single layer will form. So a mono layer of adsorbent will fall on, sorry, a mono layer of adsorbate will form on the adsorbent. The moment that that single layer covers the adsorbent, we may form a second layer. Um, obviously, that's, it's, it's hypothetical because it's clear that multiple layers will form even before the, the, the original layer is covered up, depending on how they diffuse into that adsorbent. And then even as multiple layers form, you can eventually get to a point where this, uh, the partial pressure of the adsorbent is so high that it actually exceeds and, and it just condenses onto the adsorbent. So it's a theoretical way of thinking about it. We're going to focus really only on single layers forming, um, and the reason for that we'll, we'll see when we start to look at some of the equipment and the, the models. Okay, so I thought also, just before we get into the theory of modeling these, just to take a look at what the processes look like and get, get a feeling for the equipment. Um, so that when, you, when we talk about regeneration and, um, and pack beds and how they work, you've got a visual idea of what's going on here. So this is a photo that of, of an adsorption, desorption step. It's, I find it quite weird that it stands alone. <laughs> kind of like in a desert in the middle of nowhere. But um, nevertheless, it's a good photo because we can now see the unit <coughs> get infused with the ancillary equipment around it. So this major, I don't, it, I just have access to the photo. There's no other description on this website about it. But I would presume then that this main catalog over here is where the adsorption is taking place. And what's interesting is there's enough resolution that we can zoom in here and take a look at this bottom unit just off to the side of the tower. So here's my tower and here's this pipe coming out. I would presume that you'll see based on the next slide that essentially there's my bags of adsorbent being charged through a screen to make sure I'm not putting rocks and other debris in, into, the, into the unit. So I'm charging fresh adsorbent in here periodically and pumping it into the system. Coming into the top here, I also have adsorbent from the top of the tower. So this is coming all the way from the top of the tower back down and being recirculated back up. So it's essentially a fluidized bed of adsorbent being pumped, pumped around. I would then also pump in my feed and it would contact my adsorbent over here. So we'll look at that a bit on the diagram next. Then these other units could be uh, are used then to regenerate the adsorbent. So the adsorbent will load up, get to a point where we can't load any more material onto it. We don't want to throw away that, that adsorbent. It, in fact, it might be that the adsorbate is the valuable entity that we wish to recover. And so we have the ancillary equipment here to regenerate the adsorbent and strip off the adsorbate. So let's take a look at that diagrammatically um, in a single self-contained unit. So here's a fluidized bed. Now I will say before we go into the details that this isn't widely used because this puts tremendous stress on the adsorbent material itself. But it is, um, it is a recurring unit operation in adsorption because we, we've become smarter on how to make our adsorbents. In the 60s and 70s, we, we were not able to make adsorbents that would handle a lot of stress. We're now able to manufacture synthetic adsorbents that are stronger. So this might, may be a recurring unit operation that you see in the future. But essentially what happens is 
We've got our feed containing our, our, our adsorbate of interest over here. And it's being contacted with fresh adsorbent. So adsorbent that's coming here, separating it out of the cyclone. And so here's my, my adsorbent coming down. I cool it first. I want my adsorbent to be cold because the hotter it is, the less favorable that thermodynamics are. We showed earlier that adsorption is going to release heat. So I don't want a hot adsorbent, I want a cold adsorbent so that I can release the heat and not drive my reaction backwards. So I want cold adsorbent coming down here. And these are essentially like a, like a distillation column. We contact my feed, which is gas or liquid, which contains the adsorbent. And my feed is going to come, come up over here. And in that small region, this is definitely not to scale. Uh, this, this section of the column could actually be quite, quite long. Um, but this is where I'm contacting my feed with the fresh adsorbent. And I'm loading up my adsorbent with adsorbate. What's then left behind is the rest of my fluid. So the rest of my feed, which may contain other valuable products, is, is drawn over there. That adsorbent now contains by the time the adsorbent drops further down here, that adsorbent has loaded up the adsorbate of interest. I pump in steam over here at this point, and that steam is going to flow and contact the adsorbent that's coming down. So in a counter current manner, I'm going to contact that adsorbent with steam and heat it up and drive that temperature up to take the adsorbate off the adsorbent. So the material of interest is being pushed off by steam, displacing it and with temperature, heating it up, and I will then withdraw a, a more concentrated bottom product, primarily of, of adsorbate. Um, and then there's a heating step as well to also provide extra, extra heat to, to the adsorbent. That adsorbent then comes down here and gets pumped up, recycled. So by the time this adsorbent passes through the steam and the heating, it's essentially being regenerated. I've driven off the adsorbate from the adsorbent so I can pump it back up and, and recover, recover that adsorbent to reuse it again. So there's uh, just a few notes here. I mean, as, as I've said, we, 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 we manipulate this adsorbent with cyclones. That's, that's um, one way to, to move it around. There's a, you can do this about 100 times with adsorbents and maybe a bit more with modern adsorbents. There's a, but there is a finite life cycle for these. So in this continuous process, we would have to bleed off all the adsorbent and, and replenish it. In a, if this was a batch system, we'd, have to, we'd only run the cycle at about 100 times and we'd have to regenerate our bed. So we'd have to uh, repurchase our adsorbent and, and, and build a, a new column effect. And then just a few notes that are safety issues, materials of construction are important. Uh, the other thing is that there's a, there is a, safe, a big safety issue, especially when you're dealing with adsorbents that are, are volatile and potentially explosive because we've got a heating step over here. So that, those safety issues need to be taken into account as well. If we're looking at a packed bed, um, this is more like a batch type operation where, where we're saying, for example, we're, we're just taking a wet gas and we wish to dry it, so we're removing moisture here, we would have this packed bed, drive this wet gas through, and get my dry gas out. After a certain point, that bed is saturated, and I have to regenerate the bed. So we'll, we'll look at that in the slides coming up. But essentially, you stop. The moment this gas leaving out here starts to detect moisture above the level that you're aiming for, you stop the flow of wet gas, and you take this column offline and you regenerate. So regeneration is simply you run heat through the column, steam, and you run it in the reverse direction. So we're providing heat to steam and coming down over here. That steam leaving here, that, that fluid leaving over here will be high in concentration in the material that originally adsorbed. So this is a, a, a high concentration of adsorbate over here and we can recover it either through a water trap or some other, me other mechanism. But essentially then we've got our, our regenerated bed that will then go switch back to this one. So in these packed bed systems, we always have two or more beds 
um, running, and one will be in, in adsorption mode, and the other will be in regeneration mode, and then they alternate. Now, there's, as I said earlier, there's a finite number of times that you can, you can flip flop between these before you have to uh, totally open up the bed and, and replace it with fresh adsorption. Okay, so regeneration then is the term that we give for when we're <coughs> stripping off that adsorbate, off that adsorbate. Okay, then a few other ways of doing this. Because moving that material, that adsorbent around can be quite uh, strenuous and, 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 and break it down, uh, there's, there's a number of ways that you can look at, at keeping the adsorbate, adsorbent stationary but you, you simply uh, move the adsorbent around. So here what, what we've got is we've got my fresh air, sorry, my feed material coming in here. So I've got a solvent, for example, in my air that I wish to remove. I cool that air down, again, for thermodynamic reasons. Put it in to this uh, rotary device where I'm forcing it through a packed bed over here. So in every one of these segments is a packed bed of adsorbent. So it's coming in through this and entering. By the time it, it, it comes to the center, I should have essentially a stream of air that's now free of solvent. So that, that solvent is continuously going to build up on the adsorbent until it breaks through to the outer edge. That's so that, that solvent will in fact build up on those layers as this device is rotating. So this device is rotating as well as the adsorbent building up. By the time it gets to the end, in fact, we're going to have the uh, segment over here that's fully loaded. So I would rotate this device as fast as I need to in order to ensure that it's fully loaded with adsorbate by the time it reaches that, that point. Then I wish to regenerate that bed. And, and recover my adsorbent. So what I do is I can pump steam in the opposite direction to drive off my solvent in this case, and I recover steam and solvent out here. And by, by the time that bed has moved over to the, these segments, I've essentially regenerated that bed for future use. And notice that the steam is always pumped in the opposite direction to which we loaded up the bed originally. So steam comes in from this direction. So this is going to be, this region is going to be very, very well cleaned. That region may be less, less well cleaned. But it's important that the outer edge is, is very well cleaned because what, when the solvent passes through, we want to, it's essentially creating a counter current direction. So it's going to be that this region is very well cleaned and it will it will polish all out that last solvent. We'll ensure that we can actually strip out that, that last piece of solvent. So regeneration is, is almost always done in the opposite direction to which we originally loaded the pack bed. Then I come down here, I can recover my solvent by running it through a condenser and a water trap uh, and, and recover my solvent from the steam. Okay, so, so that's a rotary device. And then the final one we'll look at is, this one's pretty clever actually. <laughs> um, instead of using a rotary device to move the material around, we actually keep the material fixed. So this is a column with multiple trays, but the solids never move, okay? So we'll see this uh, coming up. It's called, what's called a simulated moving bed. It, it simulates the bed of material moving, as we saw in the previous one, but in fact the bed stays fixed. And it does that using this very uh, clever way, um, this, this device over here. So this is a company that, that markets these columns called Sorbex columns, and there's hundreds of them in use worldwide on um, many, many different types of separations. Essentially what, what C is, is a special valve that rotates around and opens and closes pipes at different points in time. So what happens is essentially, let's, let's, uh, we can start here with uh, at, at any particular point. This particular, uh, well let's start with this, this tray over here. That tray is, is, I've got my feed material coming to the tray. It's being contacted with the adsorbent that's fixed at that point. That material over there is, is, is adsorbent that's picking up this adsorbate and I'm, I'm driving, there's a flow down the column this way. 
So I'm moving down, that adsorbates, and the feed stream coming in is progressively going to load up onto that, onto that material that's at that, at that point. So this valve is open, allowing fresh feed in. This valve over here is open, allowing the leftover feed that now should be relatively free of that the adsorbate to leave and come up in what's called the raffinate. Okay. This, uh, the rest of the, the stream comes over here. Um, the desorbent, in other words, the steam, for example, is, is entering at this particular point and also being driven down. And then that steam is loading up the, the material I originally loaded at that tray, gets desorbed and leaves in the extract stream. And so there's a continual flow of fluid this way, but the beds stay fixed. Only those four valves are open to allow desorbent in, steam in other words, to take extract out, steam loaded with the solute, fresh feed coming in at that location, and then my feed that's now cleaned of the, the solute that I'm trying to remove, leaves out in graphite. So that runs for a period of time, and then the valve rotates one notch, and then this stream that was the desorbent now moves to that location. The extract stream that was at that location moves one down, the feed moves one down, and what happens to the raffinate actually is it gets switched to that stream over there. So everything just kind of shifts anti-clockwise by one notch. So the bed stays fixed, and now for the next few minutes, the next section of the bed gets desorbed or extracted or fed with fresh material or stripped. Okay, and then that valve C will rotate periodically and move to the next section of the bed. So key here is the bed stays fixed, but the locations at which I'm feeding and stripping off the bed are changing over time. So it's a pretty neat idea. Um, then those streams <coughs> that, I, that I pull off raffinate and extract, I'll have ways to regenerate my solvents and to uh, recover the material of interest. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at a bit of, of, of some of the, the theoretical modeling here. We're going to only focus on equilibrium for now. Um, diffusion, what happens is there is a diffusion step that takes place. As you're familiar with, uh, with the mass transfer forces, there's, this material has to diffuse into, the, into this uh, packed bed, but solute of interest or adsorbate that we wish to recover needs to diffuse into the adsorbent itself, in through the pores, through a boundary layer, and then once it passes through the boundary layer, it needs to then go through the pores and find an open site on the adsorbent to load onto. So that diffusion is fairly fast, and for now we can consider our system well mixed that that, that is going to occur, or simply what we're going to look at in the next few slides is we're going to just simply say, I'm just going to wait long enough for this diffusion to happen. So diffusion is not something we're going to consider right now. We're going to focus on the equilibrium. And the equilibrium is um, the material is absorbing onto a vacant site and it's desorbing from an occupied site. So both of those reactions, essentially if you want to visualize them as reactions, are taking place and they're happening <coughs> in equilibrium. And the reason why we're looking at this is because we're going to calculate from this how much adsorbent is required for removing a certain amount of adsorbate. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, well, I'm going to assume a certain model, the reaction rate or some way that this is occurring, so that I can assume that bulk concentration is related to the surface concentration on the adsorbent. So that's really all that equilibrium says is, I realize I have some amount of material in my feed, that's my bulk concentration, and I have a certain concentration of that adsorbent, or of that adsorbate, the solute, on the surface of the adsorbent as well. What is the relationship between the, the, the concentration in the bulk versus the concentration on the surface of the adsorbent? So that's, that's what an isotherm does. It relates, it's introduced this terminology here, CAS, the concentrate of the adsorbate on adsorbent. So S refers to the site on the adsorbent where that material attaches itself. What's the amount of adsorbate, CA, on the surface S, or at that site S? 
We're going to relate CAS, that concentration on the surface, to the concentration in the bulk CA. And it's done at a fixed temperature. So it's, we've, we've cleared out from the thermodynamics and from what we've seen in the, in the physical equipment that temperature is an important parameter here. So when we establish this equilibrium relationship, it holds at a fixed temperature. If I change the temperature, that relationship will, will, will adjust. In the exact same way as a reaction rate constant will change the temperature. So there's a lot of parallels here with reaction rates um, to adsorption. And in fact, we model it exactly as a reaction rate. Now, the simplest model that can relate adsorption on the surface, so CAS, so the concentration on the surface, to the concentration in the bulk, is to simply say there's a linear relationship with a constant capital K. So let's just take a look at the units that are important. Uh, CAS is the concentration of A on the surface, so kilograms of adsorbate per kilograms of adsorbent. And CA, that's a little bit different. It's kilograms of adsorbate, but per meters cubed of fluid. Okay? That's, so slightly different concentration units. So don't assume that the CA and CAS are the same units. We can use the ideal gas rule to convert, especially if we're dealing with gases, convert that concentration to, um, to a partial pressure. So you recall that CA and PA is equal to CA times R times T. So the concentration can be converted to a partial pressure. So PA is my partial pressure of a gas. Of, of A of solute or adsorbate, and I can relate that to a concentration. So either either one of those forms could be used. You'll see uh, for, for vapor systems that we'll use the partial pressures often, and for liquid systems we'll use CA. But essentially that um, constant just it's still a constant K. We we just lump it up like <coughs> that, and the units of that constant depend on the units on the left and right hand side of the equation. So, so that's a linear system, um, and I said over there, few systems are that, are that simple. But what we'll see in, in the class tomorrow is that in many cases that, that holds um, for dilute systems as well. So essentially what we're saying is that if I had to plot CA over here, the concentration of my bulk, this is the concentration of solute that's loaded up on, the concentration of, of adsorbate that's loaded up on one adsorbent, it's essentially just a straight line, like that, the slope k. So it's trivial to calculate what that slope is, k from a lab experiment. What I want you to think about for the class next time is how would you run that lab experiment? What would you do to calculate what k is? What it, but be specific. Don't say, I just need to measure ca and cas. I want you to think and tell me how you're going to manipulate the laboratory experiments to calculate and obtain CA and CAS. So think about an, the set of experiments you would run to calculate K. Um, and then we're going to do that for this next model as well. We're also going to calculate CAS and CA. So this is this question over here. How would you set up a lab experiment to calculate K? And we'll talk about